Welcome to Reasonable Doubt. This is a live call-in show sponsored by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. My name is Robert Fickman and I'm your host. Thanks for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, first of all, a couple of quick announcements. We want to congratulate uh, Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association uh, Attorney of the Year, uh, Craig Washington, for his outstanding work. Just last week he was uh, awarded the, uh, uh, that award at our banquet, our annual banquet. We also want to uh, uh, congratulate uh, Bob Bennett, that's Bob C. Bennett, um, for his uh, uh, receipt of the Lifetime Achievement Award for Criminal Defense Attorney. Bob's a great attorney as well. We want to commend both of them. Um, tonight I'd like to welcome a very special guest, uh, David Adler. David's, uh, uh, David. <laughs> David Adler is a very good friend of mine and uh, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. And that, you know, that's not uh, his only credential being a friend of mine. Actually, uh, David's an outstanding criminal defense attorney. Uh, he's a former um, um, uh, um, CIA, what is it, uh, officer? Case officer. Case officer. Case officer. And uh, David uh, last year was the uh, recipient of the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association um, Attorney of the Year Award. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is David does a lot of federal work. And so if you have questions about federal cases or federal law, um, give us a call because um, that's what we're going to focus in on tonight. Particularly, we're going to focus on the case that David was recently featured on Nightline about where he has overturned a, a serious uh, a conviction for a man that was facing basically the rest of his life in prison. It's highly uh, publicized case. So let's talk about that, David. Okay. First, what's the name of your client? It, uh, my client's name was Edwin Wilson. He's a former CIA officer. Uh, yeah. Spent 20 years with the CIA, uh, and after he left the CIA formally, uh, ended up facing prosecutions by the Justice Department in a number of different jurisdictions throughout the country. All right. And tell people briefly, when did this occur, and what was he accused of, and what was he accused of here in Houston? Um, most of the events surrounding his case um, happened back in the early 1980s. Uh, back then, um, the Osama bin Laden of the day was Muammar Gaddafi of Libya. Right. He was the, or the enemy of the United States, still is on the enemy's list. Correct. Um, Wilson, uh, after he left the CIA, uh, continued to work for the CIA, um, handling various chores and requests that they uh, called him up about. Kind of an independent contractor? Absolutely. Okay. And uh, one of the uh, main concerns of the U.S. government and particularly the CIA back in the early 1980s was Gaddafi's efforts, Libya's efforts to get hold of a nuclear device, mm -hmm. nuclear bomb. And so Wilson um, set about and was sort of instructed or requested by the CIA to ingratiate himself with the Libyan regime to find out just how close the Libyans were to obtaining a nuclear weapon. Okay. Uh, so one what of, happened? Well, one of the things that he did to ingratiate himself with the Libyan regime was to obtain things that they couldn't obtain okay. anywhere else. Weapons? Uh, uh, one instance was uh, Wilson was uh, charged with sending a non-working M16 assault rifle and three pistols to Gaddafi. Okay. Um, that case occurred in Virginia. Not enough to start a war. Uh, probably not. Um, <laughs> the uh, Houston case, the prosecution in Houston. Yeah, what was that about? The government accused Wilson of sending 40,000 pounds, mm -hmm. that's 20 tons, of C4 plastic explosives mm -hmm. to Libya. That was all of the commercially available plastic explosives in North America. Wilson bought up every ounce that the military didn't have in Mexico, mm -hmm. um, the U.S., and Canada, and uh, had it shipped over to Gaddafi. It was his position that he did or didn't do it? His position was that he was involved in the transaction, mm -hmm. but that everything he did in Libya. Mm -hmm. um, he was reporting to some very senior people at the CIA and receiving instructions about what to do next from these same senior people. Now, ultimately, back in the 80s when he had the trial, and you were not his trial lawyer. I was not. Uh, he was convicted, right? He was. And tell the jury what happened from uh, the jury. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess. Okay. Tell our, our uh, you can see what I do during the day. Tell the, uh, 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 our Audience. viewers, thank you, uh, what happened from there? Because this is when it starts to get really interesting. Well, let me, let me just back up if I could yeah. a second. The, the way they convicted him, Wilson and his lawyers at the time made it very 
well known that his defense was going to be anything I did, I was still working for the CIA. Okay. Uh, they gave media interviews all across the nation uh, claiming that it was going to be their defense. Mm -hmm. So at trial, the Justice Department working with the CIA uh, sought to rebut that claim. Right. And they brought in an affidavit from the third highest ranking official at the CIA. Okay. And under oath, this official mm -hmm. swore that after Wilson formally left the CIA, he didn't do anything for them. Okay, so they presented a sworn affidavit that basically contradicted the defense. Absolutely. Okay. The jury went out to deliberate at mm -hmm. about, I think it was about 9 o'clock one morning, mm -hmm. um, their second day of deliberations, I believe. At 10 o'clock, they asked for the affidavit to be reread to them. So it was obviously important to them. Correct. They, um, after the affidavit was reread, mm -hmm. they went back and deliberated for about 55 more minutes, came out with guilty verdicts on all counts. One of the jurors gave a uh, quote to one of the local, actually one of the national media, mm -hmm. uh, that essentially saying that we weren't sure until we had that affidavit reread to us, but once we heard that the CIA denied any mm -hmm. association with this guy, we convicted him. So basically the jury trusted the uh, CIA. Um, and the Justice Department. Right. And there turns out what was represented to them was not completely accurate. It uh, wasn't accurate at all. It was a complete lie. Okay. Um, Wilson had continued to do things for the CIA, um, but it took him 20 years of spending time in prison to um, uh, to prove that, basically. Right. Now tell us how you got involved in the case and you know how you were able to demonstrate that, in fact, he wasn't guilty, because it's a long road. Wilson, um, one of the mistakes the government made in this case, one of the many mistakes, frankly, yeah. was they requested that Wilson be sentenced to solitary confinement, and so he was sent for the first 10 years of his sentence, he was in solitary confinement at what was generally perceived as the worst federal penitentiary at the time, Marion. Okay, in, and that's uh, in, in Illinois. Illinois. Correct. Right. Well, the problem is if you sentence someone to 10 years of solitary confinement, they have very little to do all day except right. work on their case. Wilson began fighting uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, mm -hmm. FOIA requests, the mm -hmm. law that allows citizens to obtain documents from the government. Okay. And these requests were routinely denied, and then he would file a civil lawsuit and have a federal judge sort of look it over and, and uh, order that the CIA and the Justice Department turn over certain documents. Most of those documents were very heavily redacted. Mm -hmm. but and redacted one, means that they're marked out. Blacked out. out. Okay. Um, I'm sorry I didn't bring any of the documents with me, but, but some of the documents, everything was blacked out, including the date. Now, the viewers have seen that on TV. Somebody made a mistake, I think. I'm surmising here, but okay. I think after the passage of 20 or so years, somebody... They the were. people who knew the case moved on to other jobs, right. and, the, and a document was released to Wilson, the subject line of which was not redacted, and mm -hmm. the subject line was duty to disclose false testimony, mm -hmm. or possibly false testimony. And Wilson took that letter, mm -hmm. attached it to another letter that he, he had been writing frequently to uh, the federal judge here in this city, Lynn Hughes, mm -hmm. and essentially said, if I'm crazy, if all these years what I've been claiming is not true, why would this document be in my file? Right. And at that point, Judge Hughes, um, being a very fair judge, quite frankly, in my opinion, thought yeah. maybe this man is maybe. not just howling at the moon. Maybe we need to have somebody look into this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think because uh, it was uh, somewhat known that I was a former CIA officer, he asked if I would accept the appointment and look into this man's case. And I did, quite frankly, I thought at the time Wilson was crazy. And, right. Um, what year was that? That was 1990. Seven, I believe. So eight years ago, you started fighting for this guy. Correct. And tell us, um, it's a thirty-minute show, so <laughs> okay. Give us the uh, short version. Give us the short version, if if, if you can, of, of uh, you don't have to rush through it, but it's it's a fascinating story of mm -hmm. of uh, people in authority doing the wrong thing and it being uncovered uh, by good lawyering yeah. on your part well, and by that. a tenacious client as well. Yeah. So tell us the, what happened, David. The first thing I asked Judge Hughes for uh, was to see the files, and uh, Judge Hughes thought that was a reasonable request and mm -hmm. ordered the Justice Department to let me have the files. It took some time for the Justice Department to get all of the documents together, mm -hmm. and I, I estimate eventually I probably looked through maybe 400,000 uh, pages of materials up there in, in D.C., many of which were classified, mm -hmm. some of which were not. So you had to go to Washington to look at the documents right. related to the case right? and spend a lot of time in a room by yourself looking at the documents? Uh, pretty much, okay. although sometimes some of the Justice Department lawyers were in there looking as well. Okay. Um, but I found documents that 
showed, number one, that Wilson had continued to work for the CIA after he mm -hmm. formally retired, so the affidavit was incorrect. But more importantly, I found memos that showed the Justice Department knew that Wilson had continued to work for the CIA. In the Justice Department that was prosecuting him? That same, is, very the same prosecutors people. that were prosecuting him were aware that the affidavit they were presenting to the jury in front of the judge was not true? Absolutely. One of the documents I found was a memo that the CIA wrote for their own files mm -hmm. that said, essentially, we warned the Justice Department not to use that affidavit. We warned them that it was inaccurate the day before they used it, and mm -hmm. they insisted on using it even though we told them it was not correct. And so, so that we're clear, and so our viewers are clear, what you were able to uncover was evidence that at the time of the prosecution, at the time that affidavit was being introduced into evidence that the prosecutors knew that what they were introducing into evidence That's right. was not yeah. accurate. These prosecutors who are officers of the court as any mm -hmm. attorney uh, is, um, as well as being sworn employees of the federal government, the Department right. of Justice no less, went into court and used a document that they knew uh, absolutely misrepresented what the truth was with Mr. Wilson's employment activities. Mm -hmm. And you found internal memos that demonstrated that? Many, many, many okay. uh, memos. This, uh, I was surprised, number one, that um, even though I, as you do, butt heads with prosecutors all the time, right. there are many that I think are very honorable, very ethical people. Right. But there are, like in any profession, some prosecutors who will uh, bend and, and even break the rules. Right. I was surprised at the number of memos I found saying that, um, you know, they knew this was, was wrong and they just went ahead and did it nonetheless. I found documents that literally said, do not disclose this to the judge, don't tell Wilson's lawyers about mm -hmm. this. Pretty much smoking gun. Uh, I think it's the most smoking gun document, most smoking <laughs> gunish document I've ever seen. Yeah. And, and, and um, what were you able to do once you had, you know, I, I, I take it it took you many months or years or whatever to, mm -hmm. how long did it take you to actually do your investigation and reviewing these thousands of documents? All told, it was probably about two years. Okay. Of and what were you able to do with all that? Well, I know there are a lot of people who are sort of government conspiracy nuts and, right. and have these ideas that, that I don't necessarily agree with, but uh, I didn't want the judge to look at this as just Mr. Wilson's wild claims or, or even a defense lawyer's wild claims. And so right. I really didn't make any claim in my motion that I ultimately filed that I couldn't point to one of their own documents and, and say this is clearly what it says. So I ended up writing about a hundred page document. It had three volumes of exhibits, probably 600 pages worth. Mm -hmm. um, and you had exhibits basically from the government itself that backed up what you were saying. Yeah, in fact one of the exhibits was a, a letter to Wilson's defense lawyers, mm -hmm. a proposed letter that the CIA drafted up saying we think we should send this to Wilson's lawyers mm -hmm. in which they admitted that there was a problem with the affidavit right. and I found the sort of re responsive memos from the Justice Department saying no we don't want to send this to Wilson's lawyers and so they never sent that letter. So was there uh, an internal fight uh, going on between the Justice Department and the CIA as to what should be disclosed to the defense? Th there was an internal fight. I don't think the lines were drawn uh, strictly by agency right mm -hmm. because there were one or two people in the Justice Department who were pushing for disclosure okay. and I found their memos also okay. the problem with that I think is sort of raises an interesting philosophical question in that who is more to blame in this situation the people who do something wrong but deny that they ever did anything wrong or the right. people who are involved in doing something wrong and admit to themselves this is wrong right. but ultimately remain silent about it. It's sort of a race to the bottom of the morality <laughs> barrel as far as I'm concerned. But There's a lack of morality in both, right? Uh, I think they were actually, was over, they stepped over the line into criminal conduct in, in many ways in my opinion. And, and in, uh, obviously uh, in what maybe some of our viewers don't know is that the a prosecution in a criminal case has a legal duty to reveal what's called exculpatory evidence or evidence that would tend to show the person's not guilty and if the prosecution had in its possession evidence that showed in fact that Mr. Wilson was continuing to work at the behest of the CIA which would have supported his defense mm -hmm. they would have been under an affirmative duty to disclose uh, that information which would have helped his defense uh, so in addition to supplying a false affidavit they also apparently withheld uh, exculpatory evidence. Right. I think a lot of people don't understand the, the idea that a prosecutor is required to turn over information that's helpful to the defense, but mm -hmm. there's a 
sort of a well-known Supreme Court case, well-known among criminal defense practitioners, mm -hmm. that says that the prosecutor's job is to seek justice, right. not, not just to win a case or obtain a conviction. They right. have an extra responsibility to see that justice is done. And that is sort of the, the genesis of their re requirement that they turn over information that is helpful to the defense. Right. Defense lawyers don't have an obligation to turn over things that are helpful to the government. And many people right. don't understand that, but uh, I think it makes good sense and it has served this country well for many, many years. And so when you filed uh, your motion in front of Judge Lynn Hughes, our federal judge here, and I agree with you, I think he's a, a great judge and I'm, I think we're, uh, we're, we're lucky to have him here in our jurisdiction because he's a very independent-minded person. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean he always rules in my favor because he, no, most mine. of the time he no doesn't, uh, but uh, his rulings are, are, you know. They're well-reasoned. Well-reasoned, well right. Based and, uh, on the law, which is right. really all we can ask. Yeah, they're, they're not uh, ideologically driven. Um, but tell us about what happened when you went to court on this thing. And by the way, before, before you do that, for now, right now, uh, uh, viewers, so because it's an interesting uh, story, and I did invite you to call in, but right now we're holding on phone calls because I want to give David an opportunity to tell the story. If we have time at the end of him telling the story, then we'll take the, co the calls. But for now, it's a, a fascinating story, so let's, let's get through the story. Uh, and if, and we'll, we'll take calls if we have some time. Okay. Well, we had a, a sort of a preliminary hearing where some uh, lawyers from the Justice Department in Washington, D.C. came down, and uh, one of them... Uh, a fairly brave attorney, in my opinion, fairly right. brave government attorney, admitted that um, the documents showed what I claimed they showed. Mm -hmm. um, Did he have much choice? It, uh, it was a woman, and I think she was ultimately removed from her position because of her candor, quite mm -hmm. frankly, uh, which was very disappointing and, and, right. and even frightening. Um, but no, I don't think they had much choice. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, Judge Hughes uh, issued an opinion, about 23 pages, mm -hmm. um, and uh, to me, it was quite startling as far as how disappointed Judge Hughes was with the conduct of both the Justice Department and the CIA. Almost uh, disappointment, almost to the point of anger. I, yeah. mean, I think it really comes through in, in the language he used that there was no excuse for this, and, and it really was a complete violation of, of many constitutional rights that uh, Mr. Wilson had. He was uh, extremely critical of the government, right? Very, very critical of the conduct. Um, uh, and uh, at the time, Wilson's case was sort of the trial of the century back before we had trials of the century right. every, every month or so. Right. And so this was not a sort of a small town prosecutor in an unknown case. This was a very ho high profile case. There were very, very senior people at the mm -hmm. Justice Department and CIA involved in this case. And for <clears throat> this kind of misconduct to go on at that level, I think was very disturbing to Judge Hughes. And I, th I think it should be disturbing to everybody who uh, reads the opinion. And the, uh, the opinion, of course, is published. And in the opinion, um, uh, the judge went so far as to actually name individuals that he personally felt uh, had some accountability in this? He did. I, it certainly is not a personal attack. I, I no. don't think Judge Hughes, anything Judge Hughes does is a personal attack, but, but he clearly points out uh, the conduct of certain individuals and, and why it was wrong and, mm -hmm. and how the documents um, clearly show that their conduct was, was wrong. And, and uh, when you were on Nightline a couple weeks ago, um, and by the way, you failed to completely mention my name. I, I, I really don't understand that. I but, apologize. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about you. Yeah, you're thinking, I'm sure you were. <laughs> Um, uh, when you were on Nightline, one of the things that, the, that Nightline pointed out, and, and I don't, we don't need to go into any names here, but they pointed out that the people that were involved in that prosecution, how that prosecution, because it was such a, a big prosecution at the time, how it had been a career uh, boost to all the fellows that were involved uh, in the prosecution, and it talked about how they'd gone on to uh, very important positions in the uh, uh, um, uh, government and name some of the kinds of jobs that some of these folks ended up with that were involved in this uh, prosecution. Uh, one of them became a federal court of appeals judge and is still sitting to this day mm -hmm. um, as a federal court of appeals judge. Two of them became federal district court or trial court judges. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them... Be the same level as Judge Hughes. Right. Yeah. One of them uh, remains on the bench today in mm -hmm. California. One of them uh, resigned sort of in the middle of this episode mm -hmm. uh, once my motion was filed. Whether it had anything to do with my motion or not, I have no idea, right. but, but it seems no a little coincidental. Um, a couple of them became uh, very senior managers in the Department of Justice mm -hmm. heading up the uh, money laundering unit or the fraud unit, which Are is sort of ironic. Are some of them still there? Um, the judges are, two of the judges are still in their mm -hmm. position. Uh, 
one of the prosecutors moved on to the World Bank, where he is now a senior counsel in charge of their money laundering um, operation. Have, have any of the, the individuals who are involved in the prosecution, who are involved in what appears to be, and what was found by Judge uh, Hughes to have been uh, uh, the thwarting of justice, have any of these people been held accountable in any fashion? No, is the unfortunate answer. There's an arm of the Department of Justice called the Office of Professional Responsibility, and it's mm, sort of... OPR. Right, it's one of their internal watchdogs that's supposed to discipline misconduct on the part of prosecutors. Mm. Um, kind of the internal affairs of HPD? Essentially, yeah. although I suspect the internal affairs of HPD probably does a better job than OPR <laughs> because it'd be hard to do a worse job. Yeah, well. But um, they did, uh, I did fly up to DC and uh, was interviewed for about six hours. Um, about what you... What I had uncovered. Right. Um, that was about a year and a half ago. Still waiting? Um, I called them about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, requesting some information on the status of the investigation. No one bothered to return my call. But even when I was leaving that, <coughs> that, that interview um, a year and a half ago, I, I pulled one of the DOJ attorneys aside and said, look, you know, wh what's the realistic possibility of mm -hmm. any of these people being held accountable for what they did here? And uh, the response was very unlikely. Did the government appeal Judge Hughes's uh, decision? They did not. Okay. They did not. They, uh, they because they do appeal Judge Hughes and other judges as well, but in this case they chose not to. Not only did they uh, not appeal Judge Hughes, mm -hmm. but the Justice Department in Washington, um, I am, I'm trying to do the same thing with another one of Wilson's convictions, mm -hmm. that one regarding the non-working M16 rifle and the pistols right. in Virginia. I'm about right. to file a motion to overturn that conviction because it's the Similar same theory. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The, the Justice Department in Washington, after losing the case here in Houston, mm -hmm. uh, told me if you file on the Virginia case, talk to the prosecutors in Virginia because we don't want to get involved in this again. So mm -hmm. I think they really have sort of walked away with their tail between their legs, at least as far as the main offices okay. of the Department of Justice, and they're leaving it to the local prosecutors in Virginia to pick up the pieces now. And do you think that um, uh, when it's all said and done, well, at this point, Mr. Wilson, uh, mm -hmm. he's been released from prison, right? He has. After when did he get out? Um, I think it's about seven or eight months ago. He, after spending almost 22 years, mm -hmm. uh, he was released. His birthday was a couple of weeks ago. He turned 78. It was mm -hmm. the first time in 22 years he had celebrated his birthday on the outside. Okay. Um, I did get. Uh, did he say thank you? He, uh, he, in many, many different ways, he said thank you. I've mm -hmm. I received very, very nice cards and letters from him and his family thanking me for uh, the oh, work. That's good. Um, one of the bigger thank yous came when um, I had a check for $140,000 that he paid as a fine as part of his punishment in this mm -hmm. case returned to him. Um, so he has some money to live on for That's the time good. being. So, uh, yeah, he's been very But you can't get back the years. <clears throat> uh, I can't think of a dollar figure that I would accept right. to have 22 years taken out of my life yeah. uh, wrongly. And have any of the uh, people that were involved in this prosecution, we talked about that they hadn't, nothing had happened to them, but have any of them uh, done anything to offer any sort of explanation, apology, anything like that? Yeah. Or are um, we still dealing with the arrogance of power? Um, one in particular um, has been fairly arrogant, and uh, he is a regular commentator on CNN and, mm -hmm. and those kind of cable shows, although mm -hmm. his, his appearances seem to have diminished quite a bit since Judge Hughes' opinion came out, which is another reason that I'm thankful for Judge Hughes' opinion. But, mm -hmm. Um, uh, the prosecutor who is now at the World Bank um, mm -hmm. has steadfastly refused to give any interviews and has also hired uh, a fairly well-known criminal defense lawyer himself um, in to a nice deal with his situation. Of, nice twist of irony. Apparently, yeah. he's afraid that he may be charged with something. Um, the retired federal judge uh, initially was giving sort of these um, weak explanations. Uh, he has since decided not to talk at all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, the documents are so damning in this case, it's very right. hard to explain it away. Do the documents show, like, who, received, who all received copies, and so it sort of shows who all was in the, in the, in the know? Yeah, absolutely, and in fact, there's one um, series of notes that I found, a handwritten mm -hmm. set of notes, that at the beginning of a meeting, um, who, I don't know who the note taker was, mm -hmm. but uh, they wrote down the names of everybody in attendance of the meeting, I see. and then sort of almost uh, did a transcript minutes, minutes yeah. you know of what was uh, discussed. if Robert Fickman said something it would say RF and yeah. then uh, a synopsis of what they said and this went on for quite some time was, and, was and this, this was, subject matter all discussed there? yeah th this was a big meeting between CIA this was probably the big meeting between mm -hmm. the CIA officials and the justice officials about what to do with what, what the was it before during or after the trial do you it was after the trial and uh, it was 
uh, it was at a point when some of the officials in the CIA um, had become so anxious over what had happened that mm -hmm. they really forced a meeting with the Justice Department and uh, argued some of them quite forcefully with the justice officials that something needed to be done to correct the situation, and mm -hmm. ultimately the Justice Department decided not to do anything at all. As you had worked, and we're running out of time here, but as you had worked with the CIA in your former uh, life, mm -hmm. um, were you, did you have a personal disappointment in the way they had handled it? I did, um, to some degree. I, I think, um, like with most government agencies, the CIA is staffed with some very hardworking, mm -hmm. very honorable, um, uh, very good people, mm -hmm. people that any American would be proud of. But I think they are also susceptible to those people in any organization that are mm -hmm. dishonest and uh, lazy and, and right. sloppy. And uh, the problem with the CIA, though, is they have such tremendous um, uh, ability to cover up things that they do uh, mm -hmm. and to get ac it's very difficult to get access to right. CIA documents. Do you, think, do you think if another lawyer who didn't sort of have your background uh, had been assigned to the case, mm. they, it would have been hard for them to put pieces together in terms of uh, understanding the, the language of the documents and things of that nature. I, I think it would have been possible to do the same thing that I was able to do. I think it would have taken a lot more time because right. there's a lot of government ease, government language in these right. documents, and if you don't know Acronyms. right the acronym of a, CIA, a particular CIA office, you could spend a long time trying to figure trying out whether a document is important or not. Basics. And when I was flipping through those documents, I could tell within seconds a particular document that had an acronym, acronym on it had nothing to do with the case, and I'd go right past it. In fact, there were times when the justice lawyers were coming over to me and asking me to explain what a what particular they, document it meant. meant and, because they didn't have CIA background. Uh, and not only did they not have CIA backgrounds, they told me they were having trouble getting answers from the CIA, that the, there was still some animosity between the CIA yeah. and Justice Department, which is sort of frightening when you think of the, uh, the anti-terrorist efforts that we're supposed right. to be engaging in today. We still have two agencies at war with one another. Bickering over turf. We're about out of time. What's the lesson that you draw from this, David? And last year, the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association, we awarded you with the uh, um, Attorney of the Year Award because of your outstanding work. And so what, what do you, what do you uh, and it was outstanding, I congratulate you again. Uh, uh, we all owe you a debt of gratitude for your hard work here because it means something to all of us. But what is the, the lesson that you draw from this? Well, first of all, thanks to you and, and to the organization. It was probably the greatest honor I'll ever receive in my life. Um, but I think the lesson is that when you, when you serve on a jury, your responsibility is to look very critically at the government's evidence, very, very critically. You are not supposed to go in there and just take whatever the government says and walk out of there with a guilty verdict simply because the government says it. Here was a case where you had a sworn statement mm -hmm. by a very senior uh, CIA official presented by senior Justice Department officials in a court of law, mm -hmm. and it was completely a lie. And so I don't fault the, juror, the jury in Mr. Wilson's case because right. they, they base their decision on the evidence presented. But I think in, uh, for average Harris County residents, when they serve on juries, whether it's in, at the municipal level, the state level, or, or the federal level, they need to be very, very critical and look with a critical eye at the evidence that the prosecutors are presenting. All right. Thank you for joining us. Fascinating story. My pleasure. Um, sorry we didn't have time for calls tonight. We'll make it up to you next week. It's a fascinating story of great lawyering and a great outcome. Unfortunately, the man uh, lost many years of his life in prison, but we had a good law lawyer here from Houston that got him out of prison. If you find yourself down there on a jury and you have a reasonable doubt after careful deliberation with your fellow jurors, then do the right thing. Return a verdict of not guilty. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.